Good morning, KBC. Welcome. There you go. My name is Jeremy. I'm one of the elders at KBC. We'd like to welcome you to our service, both physically, of course, socially distant, but we're here, as well as our folks that are online joining us. Today I'll be reading from uh, Psalm 95, verse 1 to 7. So Psalm 95, 1 to 7. Come, let us, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. The Lord, For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his, care, under his care. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. That guy just went on past my verse. So I'll finish verse 8. Do not harden your hearts as did Meredith, as you did the day of the Messiah in the desert. I'll just invite you all to stand with me as you sing uh, our first song. Um, and also, um, as we uh, gather together, uh, obviously socially distanced, we are permitting us to sing together, as long as that singing is in muted tones, not, not projected. Um, but we do encourage you to, to join with us um, and sing and worship our, our God and King. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is to you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every I worship you, I worship you, you are way bigger, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, you are way bigger, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you, I worship you. Cause you are way maker, miracle worker. Never stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Keep a light in the darkness, my God, that is 
thank you for uh, this morning. And Lord, as we've just sung, uh, we are so thankful uh, for your faithfulness. Uh, You are a great God, and you have demonstrated it to us over and over again, uh, through our lifetimes, but certainly through these last number of months. And so, Father, this morning, as we are so happy to be able to be together in person and online, uh, Father, we pray, Lord, that our time together would have one focus, and that is worshiping your greatness. And so, Father, be with us this morning. Encourage us. uh, Challenge us. Lord, allow us to experience fellowship again. And 
Father, we just want to commit this time to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning and welcome to King Bible Church, whether you're here in person or joining us online. We're so glad that you are here. And it's nice to see that things are slowly in our world starting to open up. And we would just continue to pray that uh, we'll be able to be together more often and, uh, and that we'll get these vaccines in, but it's good to see you all. I um, just want to let you know, if you're uh, visiting with us this morning, um, either, again, here or online, uh, if you go onto our website, there is a digital connect card, and we would love for you to fill that out just to give us a record of your visit with us and just an opportunity that we might be able to follow up with you. I do have a couple of announcements I want to make just as we get going. Uh, next Sunday, again, as we're in the red zone as a church, we've kind of made the decision to kind of go between in-person and online format just to help with kind of our reduced volunteer base right now. And so next week, we're going to be back online with one of our Sunday conversations. And uh, this is a live Facebook event, and uh, it starts at 10.30 uh, a.m., and we're going to be talking about the church again as the body of Christ. So I want to make sure that you join us online. If you're not able to join us at 10.30, uh, it will be taped and broadcast on Facebook and YouTube afterwards. Also, Easter is coming up, and Easter was going to be our next in-person service And uh, we are excited about being able to be together uh, to celebrate uh, the resurrection of our Savior. And in doing so, we want to invite our neighbors to join us, either in person or online. And so we're stepping up in a bit of faith. We have ordered 750 door hanger invites. We did this at Christmas, and we got rid of them all. Um, So we're going to do that again. So they are available today. If you would like to take some home uh, to your neighborhood and pass them out to your neighbors, that would be great. Um, We have some available. But we also want to get a bunch out to our surrounding neighbors. So if you're able to help us out, we're actually, I think there's some of us that are going to stick around after the service, maybe go grab Tim's or something, and uh, spend some time uh, early this afternoon handing them out. Um, But if you aren't able to do that today, but you would like to take uh, some and maybe hand them out this week. Um, Talk to Liz, and Liz is... Liz Liz is behind the camera. So see Liz afterwards, and she will um, set you up with some door hangers, either if you want to take them back, um, or if you want to hand them out later on. Um, But be praying for Easter. Easter is one of those times where um, we will find that our community and people are seem to be engaged and seem to be interested in the things of Christ. And so we're really looking forward to this opportunity of hopefully having a number of our neighbors uh, join us um, on Easter where they will hear the gospel. Uh, The last announcement I have is we have a couple of new um, online Bible studies. We had one start a couple weeks ago on Thursday night on Psalm 119. And uh, the details are involved in the uh, newsletter. But we have two new studies starting for the ladies. Um... The ladies group on Friday has one starting, and also Precept on Wednesday has one starting. So if you're involved in either of those groups or would like to be involved in any of those groups, uh, the details are available on our website or on, in our newsletter. And uh, just let the leaders know if you would like to be part of that because there are some material that uh, needs to be purchased ahead of time. So those are the announcements, and I'm going to invite Sam to come up and to continue leading us in our time of worship. Awesome, thank you. Um, If you can all just join me in standing uh, for our next song, uh, Christ is Enough. Um, I really love this song because it just uh, just reminds us of the sufficiency of Christ. Um, So I pray that as, as we sing this together, we'll just be reminded that Christ is indeed enough. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will sing no turning back. Set free. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything.
Christ my all in all, the joy of my salvation, and this hope will never fail, and heaven is our home. soul will sing Jesus is here to God be the glory Christ is enough for me Christ is enough for me everything I need is in me everything Father, we, we understand the, the importance of your word. Lord, your word is our guidebook to, to understanding you and to understanding how we are to uh, live as your children. And so, Father, we take, we, we understand the weight every time we open up your word. Because through it and through your, the work of your spirit, you speak to us. And uh, Father, we long to hear from you. We long to hear from you. So I pray, Lord, that you would use my faulty voice uh, to speak the truths that you would have us as a church here this morning. Lord, I pray that you would just open up our, our eyes, our hearts, our ears even now so that your spirit would be able to speak to us in a very clear way. And so, Father, we commit this time to you knowing that unless you speak to us through these words, we won't hear a thing. And so, God, be with us 
Allow us to lean in now and uh, allow us to hear your voice. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, again, thank you for joining us. We are continuing a series we started a few weeks ago uh, called The Church Defined. And we're actually going to take a number of months and kind of hit on a number of different aspects of who the church is, uh, what the church does, our purpose, um, what makes a healthy church, and also what um, makes a healthy church congregant or church member. And we're going to kind of dive into the third um, week of us trying to define who the church is. So it was actually Wednesday morning when I was uh, driving down to, uh, to church, to the office, and I often listen to 680 News. And uh, Christy drives Christy nuts because she says, well, they keep saying the same thing every 10 minutes. But, you know, it's a way to, for me to kind of tune out. So I was listening. And, and it was an interesting thing on Wednesday morning where the lead story was that uh, that particular day was the one-year anniversary that the, of the province of Ontario declaring a state of emergency in response to the COVID-19 virus. It was only, it's actually only been the second time in Ontario's history that they have declared a, a state of emergency. And I don't know about you, but on one hand, I felt it really hard to believe that it's been a year. I know when we entered this, we thought, well, it, was gonna, it felt like time was, was just kind of creeping by at the beginning. But we're a year into this. And I don't know if that's a cause for celebration or just exhaustion, but I found it really, really hard to believe that we've been in this a year. But then on the other uh, side of the coin, it's been hard to remember what life was like before. You know, being able to have the freedom of kind of doing what we want to do, when we want to do it, with whom we want to do it with. And, and so as we kind of, as I was struggling, just kind of working through some of this, uh, the newscaster asked the question, what do you long to do when things get back to normal? I thought that was a pretty profound question. What do you long to do or what do you long to be able to return back to doing when things get back to normal, whatever normal might look like? And I'm wondering either here or online if you want to ask the same question or answer that same question. Think about that. What are the things that you long to be back for? I kind of pondered that for a minute, and I said, well, what are the things I want to look forward to? I can't wait to get back to playing sports. Um, it's been a long time. I know for myself and my, our two boys, we love baseball during the summer, and it's been hard not being able to play baseball. I long to be able to just go out and hit a ball again and, and get back to that kind of competitive nature. I, I long for, looking, for just going out for dinner. And not feeling like, you know, you have to watch everything and be terrified of going to a, a local restaurant. Uh, I long to see a movie. Now, I've got a pretty decent sized screen, but there's nothing like going and seeing an epic, you know, um, I like adventure movies or hero movies, superhero movies. I, there's nothing like seeing that on the huge screen. I long to lo watch and be able to go and see the Jays play again. Um, I, now, I like baseball. And you know what? The ba Blue Jays team looks like they're going to be pretty decent this year. So I'm like, oh man, I, I would love to be able to just go and buy tickets for our family and head down to a, a Blue Jay game like we've done so many times before. I would love to be able this year to use our family's Canada Wonderland passes, which we've had for over a year, which we weren't able to use last year. See, there's so many things kind of in our social aspect that we go, wow, I would just love just to be able to do that. A couple other things. I would love, and I am looking forward, to be able to go out in public and not feel I have to pull out my tape measure to see, am I six feet away from everybody? And, and to think that if someone is in line at Costco and isn't paying attention and, and kind of steps, you know, within that six-foot bubble, I, I don't like the idea of looking back at them and giving them a glare saying, hey, what are you doing? I, I long for just being able to have the freedom of maybe getting close to people. I, I long to be able to shake someone's hand. And as you will know, I'm a hugger. 
I long to be able to give people hugs and be able to console people when they're, when they're, when they're struggling with stuff and when they're hurting. I long for the day where I don't feel like I have to go through a 40-point checklist to see or try to determine whether it's okay for me to go outside or not. But I think the thing that I look forward to the most is the opportunity to gather again with those I love. To be able to share a meal with friends, to be able to spend time together with family and extended family, some who I haven't seen in a year, and to be able to gather together as a church. And I'm so thankful that that we have some here in person. Uh, And I long for those that are... um, watching online for when you feel comfortable to come back and be in person as well. But I want to be the church again. I want to be the church. I want to be able to come together and to experience what it's like um, to join in worship together, to be able to support one another, to be able to enjoy times of fellowship and of prayer. See, I miss being with people, and that just the way God has wired me, that has been probably for me what has been the hardest and most difficult to navigate this year. And I would imagine that you're probably the same as well. See, I don't think it matters whether you consider yourself an extrovert or an introvert. Relationships matter. And I think that we all miss them. Actually, in fact, it's, it's part of our nature is being created in the image of God. We, as human beings, are created for community. We're created to walk the journey of life with others, not in isolation. See, over the last year, what I've found is that we're getting used to a lot of things that maybe we shouldn't be getting used to. That we're kind of saying, well, you know what, this is just life and We'll go with the flow. And, and, and on one way, that's a great thing to do, and, and it helps us maybe to, to navigate the uncertainties. But it's hard to think that we're getting used to navigating life with just a few. Um, for some of you, your sphere of contact has been maybe your immediate family or maybe a few close friends. And I guess my prayer as we kind of are now going to navigate this, this subject of um, fellowship this morning. Um, my prayer is this. I, I pray that as the days continue to pass, that each of us will have this ongoing and deepening longing to be together in close fellowship. To return to what the church was designed to be, a gathering of those who find their unity in Jesus Christ. So again, we're going to kind of continue on. And this morning, uh, we're going to be looking at the, the, the question or the statement that the church is the fellowship of believers. And if you have your Bibles with you, um, I would encourage you to open them up to Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 42 to 47. That's going to be our, our text that we're going to dive into this morning. So I want to begin by just saying this. We are recipients of incredible blessings by God. Amen? We are, yeah, it's okay to say amen. You can do it in muted tone, but it's okay to say amen. Um, but we are. We are recipients as believers of some incredible um, blessings and gifts from God. And when I sit back and think about, if I can name kind of the top ones, There's really two primary uh, gifts from God, this side of Jesus Christ, this side of the cross, that God has given us. Uh, The first is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, for us, is the way that we are transformed. That's the Holy Spirit's work in us, to transform us into the likeness of Christ. And the Holy Spirit, also for the believer, serves as a confirmation of our salvation. So if we have the Holy Spirit working in us and there's evidence, along with that comes confirmation that we are God's children. And I don't know about you, but that is a great blessing and that is a great gift. To know that I am his. The other great gift is this. It's the gift of the church. 
It's the gift of the church. And what we will see is in the church, we, um, we have this, this gift, this um, group of individuals who we get to do life together with. And we will find that we were never meant to live life alone. We were never meant to try to navigate day in and day out by ourselves. But we were meant to do it with others. And unfortunately what's happened, it's become far too easy to neglect both the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, but also neglect the function of the church in our lives. If you look at Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 is kind of the, the big um, thrust and the big introduction to the church. It's the point where Jesus Christ has, has left his disciples with the Great Commission. And then we have, in Acts chapter 2, we have the first of these two gifts given. And it's the gift of the Holy Spirit. You might remember the apostles, the disciples, were in the upper room, and, and, and Jesus had said, you know, until you receive the Holy Spirit, stay put. Don't try to do what I'm going to call you to do without the power of the Holy Spirit. And so they stayed there, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit came upon them in, uh, I think we lost stuff. The Holy Spirit came upon them in, in great power, like tongues of fire coming down, and the evidence of the Holy Spirit was they went out and they spoke in tongues. Now, that wasn't tongues in an unknown language, but going out into Jerusalem with all these different groups coming in for Passover, um, what they found is all of a sudden these disciples would go in amongst the people and they would speak to the people in their own language and dialect. And so we have this incredible gift, this incredible power of the Holy Spirit. And from that, we see immediately the Holy Spirit empowers these early disciples um, for the mission that Jesus Christ left them to be disciple make makers. And we see that the results are immediate and beyond amazing. Think about this. After Peter's very first sermon. So here we are, Peter. It's like, okay, Peter, you got to go preach. you got to go share the gospel. People are gathering around. And what happens? 3,000 people accept Christ after one sermon. And if you read the sermon in, in Acts chapter 2, it's not all that flattering to the people that were listening to him. Basically, Peter is pointing fingers at him and said, you put Christ on the cross. It, it, it's, he hammers them. And we see 3,000 people like that join the church. Soon after that, um, we see another, it's reported as 5,000 men respond to the gospel, assuming there was probably also women and kids involved in that. So we're probably on up to eight or 10,000 people within just a few days. And things kept growing as the ministry went on, as the gospel was shared, as the proclamation that Jesus Christ is the Savior and is alive well, the numbers just keep adding up and adding up to the point that in Acts, Luke doesn't even um, put numbers on them. He just says, well, and multitudes were added that day. Wouldn't you love to be part of a church like that? And this continues to go and to go and to go. Now, here's the question. You've got 10, 15, 20, 25, 30,000 plus individuals within probably a few weeks who have responded, and we're saying, hey, we're all in. We like this thing for the church. We're accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior. Now they're sitting there going, now what? Now what? It, it can't just be a prayer. There, there's got to be something else to what I'm supposed to do. So here's the question. What do you do with a whole bunch of new believers who are turning to Jesus Christ and responding to the gospel daily. What do you do with them? How do you help them to grow? How do you keep them connected to Jesus Christ and to one another? How do you keep them accountable? How do you support them in their need? How do you rally them to be involved in the mission? How do you, how do you help them learn what it means to serve and to live for Christ? Well, the answer to all of the above is you do it through community. You do it through the church. The church. Let me read our passage this morning. It's Acts chapter 2, 
verses 42 to 47, it says this. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, these are the early believers, and to fellowship, or into the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received the food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number uh, day by day those who were being saved. See, this passage gives us some incredible insight into the makeup of the early church and their commitments. But what I want to focus on this morning is I want to focus on this overarching theme of the early church's calling to be a fellowship or to be the fellowship. The definition, or I love this definition um, in Lloyd uh, Ogilvie's um, commentary on Acts, and this is how he defines the church. And they'll come up behind me. This is what he says. He says, The church is the fellowship of those given by Christ to each other what he has been, um, to be to each other what he has been to them, so that together they can be uh, to the world a demonstration of the new humanity he died and lived to make possible. Here's the picture. As someone becomes a believer, someone responds to the gospel, the Holy Spirit comes into their lives and begins this work of sanctification, of transformation. As he begins to work on the inside out to change our hearts, to change our attitudes, to help us to deal with sin, to be able to cleanse the dirtiness of sin in our lives, and then outwardly it hopefully begins to change our attitude our actions, the way we love others, the way we treat others. And, and so what happened is now you've got um, individuals who are starting to try to figure this out. Because we all know that when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're, you're not perfect, are you? There's still garbage. There, there's still things we need to work on and, and work out. And so what happens is as we begin to work on and work out things in our lives, we need a safe place to do that. We need others to join with us. And see, that's what's happening in this definition of the church, is that Christ actually, in his grace, in his mercy, gave us each other. Gave us each other to be able to come together, to be able to have a safe place where we can work out actively um, what God is doing in us with each other. It's an incredible picture of what the church is all about. See, the church is not a place where we come and you come into a place where people all have it figured out. And unfortunately, it's too often the church is portrayed that way. And then what happens when someone comes in the door and goes, hey, I don't have things figured out, and then they see a group of people who seem to act like they have everything figured out, what happens to that one individual? Well, the church isn't a safe place to to, to figure out what it means to to serve God, what it means to love him, how to deal with sin. Because they feel that they can't do that, they can't be honest about their sin because it appears everybody else has already figured everything out. And so in this definition, we've been given to each other as a safe place to figure out what it means to love and to serve Jesus Christ in all the messiness that it might entail. And and then what happens after that is as we learn what it means to be a fellowship, uh, to serve one another in this safe place, to learn what it means to have a place to practically work out what it means to love Jesus and to love other people, with people that are doing the same things, then what happens is together we get to take our messiness and we get to be an example to the world around us. We get to show the world around us by how we live, by how we treat one another, what redemption looks like and the difference that Jesus Christ can make in our lives. See, when people see us, not just as individuals, 
but even more so as a church, they should see Jesus. So here's the question. What is meant by the fellowship? What is meant by the fellowship? Now, churches for a long time have named certain events that we do fellowship, right? So if you've grown up, and I've grown up in church and been in church kind of all my life, and I remember that we would often have fellowship times, or we would have fellowship meals. And what would that mean? It mean, well, maybe we're hanging out after church, after we do the worship thing, and, and we're going to go back into uh, a certain room, we're going to do a potluck. Because, hey, let's face it, Christians love potlucks. We love food. Or, we as a church before lockdown, before COVID hit, what would we do afterwards? Well, we'd have a fellowship coffee time, right? It was a time that when we were done here, we'd gather out there around coffee, around treats, and we would share just, hey, what was going on in our week, and, and so much. So now, what does that tell us about fellowship? Well, it tells us that fellowship is an event, if that's how we view what fellowship is. It tells us that, well, really, fellowship means it's an event, And if it's a good fellowship time, there's going to be food involved. And it's a time just to kind of kick back and and catch up maybe with some of those that we haven't seen in a while. But let me ask the question, is this is what Luke is talking about when he talks about fellowship? It's not. See, the word translated fellowship is the word koinia. And the word means this, to have in common. To have in common. Now, If the common thing that we, or if the thing that we had in common, the common bond that we shared was an interest, then participating in an activity would make sense. So go back to baseball for a second. I like baseball. And and so for me to enjoy baseball, what I look for is people that have the common interest in baseball, and the way that we exercise our common interest in this sport is we gather together, And we go and do what? Play baseball. Um, That's where the joy comes. But is that what we're talking about as the church? See, Luke here is not talking about fellowship being a common interest with this new group of believers. But what we have in common is we have a shared life. Specifically, we have this shared life in Jesus Christ. So meaning that we're not called to participate in a fellowship or in an event, but we are actually called to be the fellowship, to be the church, to be a family. And when we look at this, Luke is not talking about the universal family of God. Now we are part of the universal family of God. We join believers from day one through to whenever Jesus Christ comes back, and we are all one church no matter where we go. But that's not what Luke here is talking about. Luke here is talking about um, to be devoted to a local church, a local family in which you can commit to journeying together with. Here's one of the biggest issues that I have seen in this past year. Now, we have had some great um, blessings, I think technology for us over this past year has been an incredible blessing because it has allowed us to continue to connect even when we're not being able to be in person. I can just imagine, my kids still laugh at me that they don't understand that I actually lived before internet. And they're kind of like, no, really? No, I can remember when the internet started and I can remember how bad computers were and you would have to type everything. What we have now to be able to log on to Facebook and, and see a video, it was like that was unheard of 25 years ago. Can you imagine what the lockdown would have been like 25 years ago? It, it wouldn't have been a, hey, we're still going to join together, you know, via Facebook or YouTube or whatever. No, it would have been March of last year. Bye. Hopefully, we'll be able to join and sing together at some point in time. So there has been a great blessing in being able this year um, to have access to, um, to being able to have you know, technology and, and join together in worship. Now here's what has happened though. With the access that we have, basically every church 
um, or the majority of churches now have something online. So when we log on, if you were to type in even this morning, church service, you would literally come up with hundreds upon hundreds, thousands upon thousands of church service that you could log into. Now that in itself isn't a bad thing, but where the challenge comes is if we do that and we log into other church services um, by actively um, being exclusive of our own church service, the service that comes out of the church that we have been uh, called to be a part of. See, what happens is when we choose to say, well, you know what, KBC service, I don't really like the Sunday conversation, or I don't like the online stuff, and, and, and this church here has a way better worship team, and their pastor's a lot better looking. And, and I, you know, I'm just going to load into that. I, I'm going to load that one up, and you know, we'll catch KBC whenever they go live or whatever like that. See, the, da- the problem is doing that and just logging into whatever service by not choosing to be part of our own, is what you've done is you've removed fellowship and accountability from your Sunday experience. What's happened is is you're not being part of a fellowship, and we're going to dig into this in a little bit. You're not being part of a fellowship, but you're watching a TV program. Now, I'm not saying that you can't learn from that, and I'm not saying don't log on to other church services, but as we're going to kind of dig into this idea of fellowship, what I'm asking is you've got to be very, very careful not to um, neglect the church um, that God has called you to be a part of, the family that God has been a po- called you to be a part of for something else. Here's how it works, and, and here's why this is um, important. Um, Actually, we're gonna, I'm going to jump into the activities side of things. So let, let's kind of, so let, let's start to, to talk about what it means then to be a church. Well, what are some of the things that, that make up of us, uh, us as a church? So if we, we look at this idea of fellowship, and, and fellowship means being together in common, um, sharing a like experience, and having a place that we can um, support one another. The question then is, what are the activities? What are the things that we as a church um, are supposed to do? Well, in this passage, we have four. Uh, Luke gives us kind of four kind of key areas of things that as the church, in its simplicity, as it first started, there's four things that we are called to do. First thing is this. The apostles' teaching, or we can uh, think of this as biblical instruction. See, the early days of Acts, uh, the message was very clear. It was the gospel message. That was the thrust and the focus of what was being preached, what was being proclaimed. That Jesus lived, he died for our sins, he paid the penalty, he rose again, and then through him, by placing your faith in him, that you can have forgiveness of sins, and you can be part of his family. That was the thrust of the early message. Now, as churches began to grow and and to begin to be established, um, we see especially within the the writings of some of the apostles, that changes. We start talking a little bit more about theology and doctrine, and we talk about Christian faith issues, about how do we live this life for Jesus Christ. And when we look at this idea, I want to bring in the idea of question, so why does this matter to do this together? We have so much Christian material out there what is the importance of doing this together rather than just picking up a book, um, logging on to some other church's website or, or church service? Why is this important to be together? Well, we do find out that early on, um, this was learning was a joint thing. Learning was something that we, they did together, possibly probably because they didn't have scriptures like we do. They certainly didn't have the access to technology uh, and information like we do. But there was something about learning together as a church that was important. I'll explain it this way. We as a church um, are going right now through um, what it means to be a church. And we need to understand that when you log on to someone else's uh, service, that service is not put together for you. You're not in mind. As a pastor, 
thinks about what he's going to preach, what he has in mind is he's thinking about his congregation, his church, navigating what they're navigating in their location, in their city, in their town, and the things that matter to them. He's not thinking about the people that could potentially log on from all over the world. If that was the case, then really we as pastors should all just get together and just kind of send out a blurb and say, okay, pastors, we're all going to preach on this passage today. And all the pastors all across the world go, okay, sure. And then it doesn't matter who you log into. But we need to understand that as we communicate truth, as we communicate biblical truth within the church, we have an audience in mind. When I'm thinking about walking through the church, why did I choose to, to go through the church to find? Why are we talking about this subject? Well, that we're talking about this subject because in our, uh, in our circumstances as a church, as a small church coming through COVID, where we've seen a lot of changes, as we get back to life, there are some things that we as a church, we need to wrestle through. We need to wrestle through what is our purpose? And what is our purpose as a church? What is the purpose of the church? What should we be doing? What should we not be doing? What does it look like for KBC to be healthy? What does it look like for KBC to be disciple makers? And, and so that's why we're tackling on this, because we have you in mind. And so this is just a, maybe an encouragement or a challenge to us, is that as we... As we learn together, that's important because we're learning together in the context of our church. And, and we're hopefully hearing a common voice from the Holy Spirit directing us. And, and so I just want to make sure that you keep um, KBC as a priority. If this is your church, uh, make sure that you either in here person or tune in um, for our message that we need to learn uh, together. And so that was the idea of the, the apostles' teaching. The second thing here is this, that uh, Luke talks about um, this idea of fellowship as being another key activity within the early church. And this is a commitment to one another. And if you want to know what does it mean to be the church, what does it mean to have a commitment to one another, here's your homework this week. Go back and start looking up the one another's in the New Testament. Because that's what Luke is talking about, and that's what's going to be expanded as the New Testament unfolds. It's the practical aspect of fellowship of what does it mean to live life together? What does it mean for us as a church to function together in this thing called the fellowship? What is our commitment to one another? And as you read through that, you would see something, uh, commitments like a mutual love for one another, uh, a time to be instructed together, opportunities to support one another, opportunities to encourage one another, to correct one another when we're wrong. And this isn't a, a hammer, but this is a, hey, coming alongside people saying, you know what, I know you're learning this. That's sin. And let me help you walk through what that looks like and what repentance looks like. Uh, it, it would be learning what it means to forgive and actively forgive each other, to serve one another, to lift up others in prayer. See, these are all the um, aspects of what it means to be a fellowship. And here's the key. The purpose of Christian community is to have a place to learn, to grow, and to live out our faith together with all the others walking in this journey. And so we need to be committed to the fellowship. We need to be committed to one another. And we're going to look at a couple of uh, challenges at the end. The third aspect that uh, Luke describes is the breaking of bread. And I'm going to say this speaks to hospitality. Now we will sit here and go, well, the breaking of bread, doesn't that mean communion? Yes, it does. But in Paul's references, and he references breaking of bread twice in this passage, um, he uses a double meaning. Where yes, there is this aspect of joining together to celebrate communion, which Jesus Christ um, told us as a church we need to do. But there's also this aspect of sharing meals together. And the reason why Luke doesn't um, differentiate between these two um, ideas of breaking bread is because they were so tightly um, wound together that you could not break them apart um, and it basically is this idea is that 
that within the early church, it was not something that they said, well, you know, to be the church just means that we're going to show up on Sunday. And, and that's my involvement in the church. As long as I get there, as long as, you know, God puts a star next to my name in heaven, then I've done my duty. Or even added to, well, I'm going to also sometime during the week, I'll attend a small group. And that's my commitment to the church. No, this was a family aspect. And, and the early church is they shared meals together almost every day. That there was this idea that they threw open their homes to hospitality. And, and that they invited people into their homes to, to share not just a meal together with, but to share life together with. You will find that when you share a meal with, some, with someone, that's when the conversation takes a turn, doesn't it? That's when you feel the comfort of saying, you know what, it's been a tough week. There's some things I've been struggling with. And, and it's been tough. I've had this problem. I've had this problem. It, it, it's that fellowship time, that commonality when you throw up and you have those conversations that you have the opportunity of saying, hey, can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? Let, let's navigate. Let's talk about that. See, hospitality and worship were, were linked together in this incredible thing called the, ch the church. It was not an event to attend on Sunday, but it was a lifestyle that they lived. They involved each other in, and, and they were committed to one another every day, not just one day out of the week. And here's what the challenge is for us, is it's hard to let our ga guard down, isn't it? It's so hard to let our guard down when we don't see each other. It it's hard to, to have those deeper conversations and get past the surface when we're not involved in each other's lives. And that's why this early church made sure that they were involved in each other's lives right from day one. The last thing is this. It's prayer. God moves when we pray, amen? Lives are changed when we pray. Sickness is healed. People are saved. Relationships are restored. Peace is granted when we pray. KBC, we need to be a praying church. Case closed. We need to be a praying church. I'm not looking at what we've done before. We've had great times and we've had rough times. But moving ahead... From this day forward, we need to be a praying church. In the coming weeks, we're going to be adding a prayer corner to our weekly newsletter. I know many of you get the prayer chain, and that's kind of for those specific uh, emergency things. And if you want to be part of that, jump on our website and you can sign up for that. But also as part of our newsletter, we're going to have some items that we as a church can just be praying about together. And we're going to be involving times where we can get together and pray, whether it be in person or online. But we need to be praying for one another. We need to be praying for one another. So there you have it. There you have it. Living as the church is not complicated. It's not a list of 100 or 200 rules to say, well, if you want to be a good church member, here's what you have to do. Luke says four things. Luke talks about four things. Where he talks about, um, go back to him. talks about this idea of, of being taught together, of enjoying fellowship with one another, of being in this commitment to one another, of breaking bread, of, of sharing our lives together through hospitality and just being together to have those conversations and prayer. See, it's not complicated, but it does take a lot of devotion. And I guess that would be what should be expected as imperfect people um, seek to walk together in this imperfect world. See, it's a journey that will require for us love, grace, mercy, patience. But I can guarantee you that the results are worth it. And here's the results. Here's what happened when the early church said, we will be committed to those four things. That we're going to be taught together, we're going to fellowship together, we're going to deepen our relationships, we're going to open our homes so that we can have those conversations, that we can support each other, and we're going to pray together. You know what happened? They didn't have to go out and have awkward conversations with their neighbors. 
than to say, um, can I tell you about Jesus? They didn't have to have those conversations. You know why? Because the world around them saw believers, saw the church who were made up of a bunch of misfits, people that should never have ever gotten along, but had a common bond, not in activity, but had a common bond in a life shared in Jesus Christ. And when the people outside looked at the church, looked at how they loved one another, how they served one another, how they cared for one another, how they wanted to be together, how they were growing and being redeemed together, how they were dealing with sin together, their commitment to pray, those outside the church said, I don't see that anywhere else. I need that type of community. And so they were banging on the doors saying, how do I get in? That's my dream for our church. That's my dream for our church, is that we will learn again. And it's been hard this year. Community has been so hard. We feel so distant because of everything that's going on. But we have to start rebuilding that. We have to start rebuilding that. Here's my prayer. Beyond anything else, my prayer, my dream for us as a church is that we will seek to be a real community. That we will be committed to walk with one another through the ups and the downs of life. That we will be there for each other whenever we need to be. That we will live a life marked by our Savior. The transformation that takes place and we'll be able to share that with one another. And we will be passionate to see others join this messy family called the church. So I want to leave you quickly with three challenges. They're very easy, very straightforward. Here's the first one. I want to encourage you to pick up the phone and call at least one other KBC family this week. We have to be rebuild community. This isn't just a few people saying, hey, I like talking to people, so I'm going to call the list. We've had a couple people who have done that, and they've done a fantastic job, and I want to thank them for that. And you've received probably some of their calls. But that's not community. That's a couple people exercising their gifts. And so I want to encourage you, whether you're here, online, make an effort. Pick up the phone and call at least one other KBC family this week and simply have a conversation. How are you doing? I want to encourage you. Are you doing okay? Is there something I can be praying for? Is there something I can be encouraging you in? Guess what? If you have a lot more time, call two families. Or call three families. But start with one. We have to rebuild this thing. We as a church need to know that there's other people within our community who are going to bat for us. Second thing is this. Make a commitment to attend our Sunday morning service either in person or online. I'm not saying you can't log in and be encouraged by some other service, some other church worship. I'm not saying that at all, but don't do that and neglect meeting together as a church. And I know sometimes there are um, aspects where maybe you can't get internet and stuff like that, and we need to work with that one. But, but if you have access to either being in person or online, um, I just want to make the, uh, the, the, the challenge, commit to attending Sunday service at 10.30 when we join together. And if you're online, say hello. <laughs> say hello. Let us know you're there because often what we see is we see a bunch of views or whatever and we have no idea who they are. So if you're online joining us, say, hey, it's us. We're glad that we're here. We would love to be together. Make that commitment. And the last one is this. Pray for K- KBC as we navigate the coming days and work towards being back together. Here's some things we can be praying for. Pray for wisdom for the leaders, for the elders. Uh, this has been a tough run. Um, we have not always made the right decisions, uh, but we're doing the best we can. And, and we appreciate the grace that you have given us as we've tried to navigate a whole bunch of stuff of uh, being a small church and trying to navigate this. But continue to pray for the leaders, continue to pray for the elders as we seek to, um, to guide us out of this um, pandemic and this ever-changing landscape. Pray that God will help us as a church restore a sense of fellowship after so long apart. 
we need to, we need to feel connected. Uh, we don't, we're the same as every other church out there right now, but we need to feel that we are connected, that we are a part of a fellowship. Pray for our upcoming Easter service, that God would use this as a time of encouragement, celebration, an opportunity to reach our community. And, uh, pray for our ongoing partnership with the, the King Food Bank. So we're part of coming out of this is we're, we're finding out there's some huge needs in our, in our region. Uh, one was a, a big one is, is the King Food Bank, who we partnered with through Christmas stuff before, is saying there is a, a dire need. They can't get together. And so we had a call, Lisa, probably a month, couple, month and a half ago from one of the ladies at the food bank saying, can we use your facility? I've got a basement full of clothes that have been donated, but we have no way of getting it out. So what we've done is we had the first one uh, last week, and we're committing our basement. It's basically set up like a clothing shop right now. And over the next f- at least four months, hopefully longer than that, um, we're inviting people from the community to come in and just take what they need. But be praying for that. Be praying that it would be an opportunity for us to serve our community. And then finally, pray that God will allow us to be used to reach this community for the gospel and for Jesus Christ. So there's a couple things to be challenged about. Um, we need to be fellowship. We are a fellowship. And now as we come back, we so desperately need to, to put that into practice. So let me just close in prayer. Father, Oh, Father, it has been such a long time, and, and fellowship and community is one of those things that have been so hard to navigate through this time of separation. But, Father, that is so key for us as a church to move ahead and to grow. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, that no matter what effort we've put into it the last 12 months, no matter where we're feeling, whether we think we've done a good job or a bad job, um, this is not about pointing fingers at anyone, but this is about drawing a line in the sand now and saying we need to move forward. And so, Father, my deepest prayer is, Lord, that you would help us to rebuild that fellowship, to rebuild that sense of community. We know there's still going to be challenges in the days ahead, and, and, and just help us to navigate that. Um, but, Father, help us to, to make that commitment to grow together, um, to serve one another, uh, to encourage one another, whether it be in person or even by phone right now, uh, to be praying for one another. Um, Lord, we just pray, Lord, and, and just ask that you would guide our church in the coming days. And Lord, that you would, you would repair any hurt, that you would repair maybe the distance or just not being able to be together. And Lord, that you as a church would renew our passion, renew our longing for you, renew our, our passion for one another and our passion for this community around us so that we can be the lighthouse in King City that we long to be. So Father, we just pray that you would go ahead of us, that you would do the impossible. And Lord, that you would find it in your grace, in your mercy uh, to use KBC for your eternal purpose. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, it's an amazing uh, picture of the church and the fellowship that we can have together. Um, And the amazing thing about our God is that he's He's given us that example of commitment to uh, to love, to to never to never give up on that love. Um, and our next song, if you just uh, join in me in uh, standing and singing together, uh, one thing remains: just sings of how God's love never fails. And as we sing that and remember of His example, that we would be encouraged to not give up in our fellowship together, in being a family, in loving one another, and in, in those challenges that we've just heard now. that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constant in the trial and the change 
one thing remains. One thing remains. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me, your love. And on and on and on and on it goes. It overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never ever have to be afraid. Cause one thing remains, yes one thing remains, your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me, your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. So thankful to um, to enjoy this gift, um, your the gift of your spirit, the gift of your your church, this fellowship. God, we can share um, our lives with one another um, in this amazing way. Father, I really pray that we would just um, take in uh, all the words that we've heard today. God, that um, your spirit would remind us um, just this week as we pick up the phone, as we um, commit to attending. God, as we commit to pray. God, I really pray that we would just live out the amazing uh, reality of being a church family. God, being um, open with one another, letting our guard down uh, and just really um, living that amazing life that God, the um, example of the church that can't be found anywhere else. Um, and God, I just commit um, this, this week to you uh, as we head off in our, in our lives in various roles and responsibilities that God, this truth would sink uh, deep in our hearts. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, uh, yeah, just um, God bless. Uh, have a, a wonderful week. It's so good to see you all, uh, both in person uh, and at home. And uh, we'll see you again soon. God bless. <laughs>